Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me as we start a new series, Advent Journeys. Today's message is on the journey of John, and our passage of Scripture comes from Mark 1, 1 through 3. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. God bless the reading of his word, the word of God for the people of God. Be the voice. Do you hear the voice? Prepare the way of the Lord. Do you hear the voice? Make straight paths for him. Do you hear the voice exclaiming, proclaiming that Messiah is coming? Do you hear the voice? Are your ears attuned to the whistling wind, the breath of God as it pretends the arrival of the mystery, the greatest event in history, the arrival of God's Son on earth? Joyous cries amidst the agony of the virgin birth. Can you hear the voice telling one and all that the light streaming from a cattle stall will change the world in unimaginable ways? But only if we listen and we believe what this child will soon achieve as he comes of age and brings new light to our weary, dreary, damaged plight. O come, O come, Emmanuel, God is with us. Listen above the fuss and joyous chorus. Can you hear it? Can you speak it? Are you the voice crying in the wilderness, calling one and all to answer heaven's call? Make straight the paths for him. Sing it bright to the delight of cherubim and seraphim. Behold the light of the world. Are you the voice that can be heard by ears in dark and silent places, speaking grace to ancient faces of the people who sit waiting, anticipating the glory of the coming of the Lord? Is your voice joined with the chorus of those who believe, those who intercede with the Creator on this oh-so-noble and silent night? Be the voice. Be the voice. At the end of the 19th century, many, many people felt they were living at the greatest moment in time for humankind. As so many investors created ways for people to save time and energy, new ways to ease the burden so heavy on the shoulders of the common man. Steam power gave rise to so many new ways to travel from ships to trains to automobiles. Alexander Graham Bell was delivering on his promise of telephones for the masses. Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla were in a somewhat unorthodox battle over the virtues and dangers of alternate current versus direct current as power plants were being built to bring electricity to businesses and homes. With the progress of electricity came innovations in home appliances and lighting, and everywhere people looked changes were taking place to the fabric of people's lives as they lived inside this utopian bubble, awaiting their opportunity to engage with the world in new and exciting ways. Not the least of these inventions at the time was the rise of the automobile. But people saw the automobile as a novelty, a fad. It had to be as such because the price of an automobile, steam or gasoline powered, was so expensive and at the time, both steam-powered and gasoline-powered engines were being used in, as the industry fought to find a standard. That was until Henry Ford built the first gasoline-powered automobile manufacturing plant in Detroit, which came online in 1913, allowing the production of the Model T to go from hundreds a day to thousands a day. Suddenly, vehicles were available to the masses rather than just to the rich. Now, not everyone saw the invention of the automobile as a good thing. A great deal of that anxiety came from the fact that, although people stood stupefied at the changes invading their everyday lives, they were not necessarily embracing all that change, and the change from horse 
buggy and wagon to automobile left many people quite skeptical of the new mode of transportation. Now, in 1898, the state of Vermont passed a law that gave credence to the fear that so many had towards these new machines. It was common in those days that farmers would herd their sheep and cattle down the same roads that had been built for horses, buggies, and wagons. No one at the time had envisioned the possibility or of something like an automobile having any value for a farmer. And after all, the, the horse and wagon work just fine for their needs. If it isn't broke, don't fix it. But Vermont saw a problem with having herds of cattle and sheep being herded on the same road that might also see the occasional automobile. And because the balance of needed transportation fell on the side of the horse and buggy, since the infrastructure already existed to support it, there had not been a time and there had not been time to adapt that infrastructure for uh, self-powered vehicles. So, like I said, they passed a law and it read like this: the owner or person in charge of a carriage vehicle or engine propelled by steam, except road rollers, must have a person of mature age at least one-eighth of a mile in advance of the vehicle to warn those with livestock, livestock of its impending arrival. If at night, it also required the aforementioned person to carry a red light. The law did not apply to rail vehicles. Now, it's hard for us to imagine seeing any sense in that law today, but, but that is because we're looking at the law from where the future has shown us that such a law is impractical. But the farmers thought it was a pretty good law. However, the people that owned the automobiles, the wealthy and most influential people around, did have a problem with the law. The law was supposed to protect the farmer, had, had slowed the development of industry in Vermont so much so that it almost extinguished the use of the self-powered vehicle in that state. So within two years, the law was repealed. In a capitalist society, the wealthy often get their way. Why do I tell you this story? I want you to pretend that you're a flagman in 1898. Your sole job is to walk down a road, staying at least an eighth of a mile ahead of the, an, an automobile to make sure that the path is clear for the vehicle coming behind you. You often can't see that vehicle. There are hills and trees and buildings and, and turns that obscure your vision of the vehicle. But you have to make sure that uh, uh, you're walking fast enough that the automobile that you're responsible for doesn't catch up with you. But you also have to walk slow enough as you don't bend the boundaries of an eighth of a mile too much. You're, you're to announce the coming of the vehicle to anyone else on the road and tell them to clear the path. That includes anyone with herds of cattle or sheep. It isn't an easy or empowering job. It doesn't take a long time for you to begin to realize that you are walking along, that you, as you're walking along, that your purpose isn't about you at all. It's about the vehicle behind you. And as a matter of fact, you could easily begin to realize the silliness of the law involved and that you really don't feel much purpose at all in what you are doing. But boy, do you have a great deal of time to think on such absurd matters? You know, we often think of John the Baptist as an older man with a scraggly beard, somewhat portly in build, dressed in ragged robes, living off locusts and honey in the middle of the desert. For some reason, when I think of John this way, Friar Tuck from Robin Hood comes to mind. I, I, I do want to challenge that notion just a little bit here. John was only a few months older than Jesus, and I'm pretty sure that he didn't fall, uh, get fat living off locusts and honey. He was a Levite because his father and mother were both of the lineage of Aaron, but the Bible never tells us that he was assigned any temple duties. John chose a life in the desert to be closer to the common people. The messages that he brought of the coming of the Messiah were meant for all of Israel, not just the elite. And this was his way of ensuring that the message reached all people. 
his circle of influence was much larger simply because he was not confined by the walls of a city. And by delivering his message this way, distancing himself from the religious leaders, he became a hero to the people. He was the, the people's priest, non-traditional. This made the powers that be uncomfortable. He became so popular that it was feared that he would cause the people to rise up in rebellion. He also called out the transgressions of Herod Antipas, which is why he was let off to jail and eventually beheaded. Now, John performed baptisms in the desert, baptism being a common Jewish expression of repentance, of one's sins and the ritual cleansing, and this washing away of, of those sins. And as he preached and taught the people, his main message can be found in John 1.27. He is the one that comes, who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And by serving in the capacity of the people's priest, his expanding congregation allowed him the ability to take his message to as many people as possible. John's ministry was well established by the time Jesus comes to him to be baptized and it was during Jesus' three-year three year ministry that John was arrested and beheaded. Now, while it is possible that John and Jesus might have interacted at some point before Jesus came to, uh, began his ministry, the Bible doesn't discuss this. They were cousins, and Jesus' mother, Mary, was close to her relative, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, so it is possible that they did enjoy each other's company as children at some point. And I, I find this following story in John extremely interesting and something we don't hear often. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and, I will, I will, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that night with him. And it was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to follow his brother Simon, Peter, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which translated is Peter. Now, we only know the name of one of the two of John's disciples that followed Jesus that day. It was Andrew, Peter's brother. And after spending the day with Jesus, Andrew tells his brother Peter, who returns with Andrew to follow Jesus. Now by this time, by, by this we know that the disciples of John the Baptist that became disciples of Jesus, which also is outside of our common way of looking at this period of Jesus developing ministry. The story that most of us are more familiar with is found in Matthew 4, 18 through 20. Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers. They were Simon, his name was Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were putting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, I will make you fishers for men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Now, once again, we have two stories of the same event told from two different perspectives by two people who wait years before they get around to writing the Gospels. It doesn't mean one apostle is right and the other is wrong. It just means that the events were witnessed by two separate eyes. And remember, both of these stories are told by people at a time when they were called to be, uh, before they were called to be disciples. Unless, by chance, Matthew or John was the other disciple when Andrew was, uh, in the story from uh, John the Baptist. But we simply don't know. And no one intentionally threw a monkey 
into this story to confuse us. What I really want to take away from all this is that the journey of John the Baptist was not a journey to Bethlehem. It was not a journey to Jerusalem. It was not a journey that followed standard religious practices. It was not a journey authorized by the religious leaders of the time, nor was it an offshoot to temple worship. And while John the Baptist never told anyone to ignore tradition and the values of their heritage, he did explain that changes were about to occur that would get woven into the very fabric of understanding of who God is and his relationship with his people. John was the flagman for a vehicle that he seldom saw coming behind him. And even though he couldn't see Jesus that often, he always knew that he was there. He was sold on the message that he had been preaching. Look, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. The only time we see his faith wavering is when he is in prison awaiting execution, asking that Jesus validate his message. Things are looking pretty dark, and John, just like all of the Israelites, are expecting a different kind of savior, a warrior, a vindicator. It is no wonder that the loving message of Christ might be might have caused serious doubts for John the Baptist and his followers. John 7.20 reads, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to, for, to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And Jesus replies, go back and report to John that which you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, that last verse throws a lot of people. What does Jesus mean by saying, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me? Jesus is telling John that he understands that Jesus is not what John was expecting, but he should consider himself blessed to finally understand the truth. The truth that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Now, we are so blessed to be on this side of the cross that we are able to look back on all the wonders that Christ has brought to this world. The greatest being the salvation of our souls, so undeserved by us. Jesus becomes our portal into the very presence of, cre of the creator of the universe in spite of our transgressions and our sins. As we enter this Advent season and embrace the joy and wonder of the birth of Christ, let us embrace the love that Christ has shown each of us. Let us praise him for coming to us in the form of a human, not only to bring salvation, but to show us how to live lives that bring glory to our Creator. John stood at the threshold. How exciting this time must have been. How exciting to know that he was called to proclaim the coming of the long-awaited Messiah. But how about us? We have the same message, a message based in faith and in history, a message that transcends the glory of humankind and lets us sing of the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. We love because he first loved us. We live because he first showed us how to live. We have a story to tell, a story to shout at the top of our voices. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. It is he that came to us to rescue us from the darkness and bring us into the light. Those words should be foremost on our lips as we draw ever closer to our Creator. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John found his voice. Can we find ours in the chaos that attempts to enslave us and keep us mute? 
Be the voice. God bless you all. Amen.